Hello. Wham. Wham. Uh, welcome to a Silverline Show on Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim TK, and I'm joined, as always, by Quentin Bedwell. Yes, coming to you live from the Silverline Studios. Yes. Get ready for awesome. Engaged. <laughs> and we uh, finally used the right intro, so that's a win. Uh, yes. Yes. But uh, yeah, we, we are a show that happens on Tuesdays, and today we're going to be talking about why comics belong in the classroom. Um, so we'll be getting into that in a second here. But uh, we didn't get a chance to uh, catch up before the show. I, I was running in from uh, another room. Uh, so, Quentin, how have you been doing? I am been doing well it's uh been really good uh been on trips and having all kinds of you know family stuff going on so nice. uh, yeah and not to mention the kickstarter going on right now get on over there and pledge yes I think we already hit our, our initial goal didn't we yes we did we did uh we did fund but now we are reaching for stretch goals, and that's what I'm going to be yeah. drawing tonight on st- on stream is some of the stretch goals for y'all to have a sneak peek at. Very I think cool. We can show them, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you want to get your hands on some cool indie comics, and uh, if you're watching it live, you can go do it now. If you're watching the VOD, you, you still have some time uh, to go ahead over to uh, our Kickstarter and uh, go ahead and uh, fund it. Get yourself some uh, dope comics and get us closer to some stretch goals so you get some additional goodies. Get more bang for your buck. Yeah, there's already it's already just packed with value, the whole Kickstarter is. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and this these stretch goals that we're doing, that just adds even more. I mean, uh, there's three books this time yeah. around. So, I mean, that right there in itself... You know, you're getting three books, uh, three different sets of creators. It's, it's unheard. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, unlike some other uh, Kickstarter groups, uh, we actually fulfill when we uh, <laughs> read goals. Yep. Yeah. Um, so far, we are, we got perfect reviews. We have not missed a backer. So very proud of our record there. Uh, so today we are talking about why comics uh, belong in the classroom. Uh, Roland messaged me. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Um, uh, talking about uh, some some Twitter stuff. All right, uh, so we're talking about uh, why comics belong in the classroom. So uh, for, this, for those of you that uh, think this subject sounds familiar, uh, that's because there was a TED Talk about four years ago by... Uh, a gentleman by the name of Gene Yang, uh, who talked about his experience as a teacher bringing comics into his classroom. Uh, so uh, we're not quite hitting on the same points. We're going to be talking about uh, talking about it from a slightly different angle, uh, but we will hit on a few of the uh, same same key points that uh, make up the history of why comics in the classroom is uh, perhaps was was more controversial, not as much anymore, but still not uh, as commonplace as. You know, uh, we might like to see it. Uh, so uh, starting out, I'll say it. Uh, I, I am younger than Quentin, uh, so we went through schools at a different time. Uh, but in my um, personal like, experience, I didn't get. We had film as literature in high school, uh, but still really no comics or graphic knowledge or anything. Like that. It wasn't until. Uh, I got to college that uh, we actually read through, you know, graphic novels or, or comics as part of the core curriculum, um, and actually had like a decent collection of them in the library. Uh, so I don't know about your experience in school, but uh, were comics even a consideration in school while you're going through it? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, yeah, and it, they were very frowned upon uh, from like peers. Like if mm. you if you if if you were a known comic book person, then you know you were marked. You uh, were a nerd. Even though you know, I know for a fact a lot of them you know read comics for as sure. well. But you know how it goes. You know, yeah. in school and anyway. Uh, but yeah, no, as far as academically, not, I mean, there was a lot of potential there and, uh, you know, aside from tiny little cartoons and stuff like that, you know, little characters, that's about it. 
but I mean, it could have been so, so used. I mean, cause comics are great for learning and teaching and, uh, you know, people really retain, uh, yeah. stuff they see in a visual format. I mean, yeah, I don't Absolutely. get it, but yeah, not, not too much, not too much on the academic side. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. Talking about the overall history of, of comics in the classroom, uh, comics, uh, rose to popularity, um, you know, throughout world war two, uh, starting out right before then. And then, uh, as the war's going on, kids at home, uh, were able to, you know, that's kind of like their, their escape from the dreariness of living through the forties. Um, and then uh, 1945, 1946, you actually did see some comics get featured in the classroom because, uh, you know, it's a new form of literature and and always something that, you know, uh, academics are always uh, probably the, 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 most eager to jump on something new and exciting before it gets smacked out of their hands by some other uh, researcher. And that's kind of exactly what happens. Uh, there was a uh, child psychologist by the name of Dr. Uh, Frederick Wortham who wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which essentially uh, 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 posed the argument that comics were turning children and youths into delinquents. And mm. it, uh, it was so prevalent that it uh, ended up turning uh, into a whole thing. The Senate started having hearings on whether or not comics were good for moral character, and, and that took them out of the classroom at that point uh, in the 50s. Um. So it actually was it. So for a while, their comics uh, weren't in the classroom just because there's a whole, you know, political debacle with it. You know, uh, always always good for ruining our fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then even after, uh, you know, uh, 70s and and uh, more so the 80s, comics start catching them back on with uh, the youths and get, get a little more popularity. Um. Uh, now it, uh, it gets to the point though, where also you're in, you're in peak jock culture. Uh, everyone's all into muscle beach and, uh, uh, you know, the rise of the body blow that happened in the late seventies takes pop culture. So yep. now comics aren't featured because if you're uh, a comic reader or you're an arcade kid, then you're a nerd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, a little did they know that in, 40 years or so uh nerds and jocks would kind of become the the same archetype because it's all about min maxing everything is all about numbers <laughs> yep yep yeah it's amazing the whole dynamic uh back then it, i think uh it's a lot more widely accepted now of course mm -hmm. uh it, but back then it was uh it was you could get tortured for uh you know letting your colors show uh absolutely i mean uh you get a lot of hate uh just you know from people like i say that you know were reading comics as well but yeah. you know they would never let anybody know that of course right yeah because it would uh end up tarnishing their cool cred um yep. yep but now yeah comics are uh much more widely popularized um uh thanks to you know uh just nerd culture exploding in all assets. Uh, video games are the uh, biggest grossing form of entertainment. Uh, and the MCU is the most successful film franchise to ever exist. Uh, and you can't go, you know, into a shop without seeing Captain America or Spider-Man on a shirt or uh, a tchotchke or whatever. Uh, they're everywhere. Yeah, it's uh, it's really I, I, I totally welcome this age for mm -hmm. several reasons, but one of them being back, you know, you talking about the muscle bound 80s era where everybody's in the gym and all mm -hmm. this, you know, craziness going on. And another thing, too, is like you could just look forward to a Dracula movie like every couple months there's like you know a new <laughs> yeah. dracula movie or i mean we went through whole stints of super action movies and uh you know anything other than action it was like uh you know it, it seemed like there was dracula movies every every couple yeah. months i mean it was crazy 
them just doing and redoing Frankenstein and Dracula and, you know, they, you know, a, a superhero movie just couldn't make it off the ground until finally, you know, Batman, uh, Tim right. Burton's Batman. Um, so, yeah, I am, you know, I, I definitely love this age for this, you know, the, yeah. that that you can't. You can't watch a movie without there being, uh, or you can't go to like, you know, go on your TV. And I was going to say go to a movie store, but <laughs> what are those? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, you can't go through your services, your streaming services, and not see some sort of superhero type thing or people with special abilities and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, it's it, it's great for that. And uh now we are starting to see uh, comics get introduced into the classroom in, in different ways. And uh, Gene Yang's TED Talk, he, he talks about how he did that. Uh, actually, uh, what he ended up doing is uh, he, uh, while he was a teacher, he's also a professional cartoonist. So um, while he was teaching math classes, uh, and if he had to be out, he would draw uh, like a four or five page comic of the uh, History of Superman was out before Tim Burton's Batman. Uh, yes, I don't know which one had the bigger box office. I know they both did well. Uh, I'm which on, one? What are you talking uh, about? Chris Reeves, uh, Jeff Potts on the YouTube. Oh, yeah, Chris. yeah. The Reeves Superman's out before the Burton Batman. I want to say, I want to say Burton Batman did have a slightly better box office. I'll have to double check that, but well, I the, that, well, yeah. it would have been, been helped in those full parts. I, I, I will uh, agree to that. that. Superman lit the fire. Mm -hmm. But there are consequent failures after the first one, you know, after, I mean, one after the other, they just got worse and worse and people got, you know, fatigue Yeah. and, uh, yeah. But whenever Batman came along, I mean, man, every, I, you know, I, I, everybody had a Batman shirt on. Yes. Everybody had a Batman that 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 old oval logo on their shirt and it was the coolest thing to have that and i mean there was uh for the first time there was batman video games and you know all that stuff and um yep. i don't remember that as much with superman now superman yes. you know they they did have some merchandising and stuff but it was never never on the level that batman was but yeah you are correct that superman i i believe he kind of started it you know in that mm -hmm. direction but man batman was the guy yep uh, he, so he I'll brought it that, home uh that uh shacks steel was the uh <laughs> there we go we was, gotta have yeah. his mention in here yeah um yeah, uh, so what uh, Jin Yang did, he would draw the math lesson as a comic and then use that to uh, essentially teach the class when he had a sub in. Um, kind of like Pete does. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so for what we're going to do for the, for, uh, for since uh, neither of us teach math. Uh, <laughs> I did used to teach math. True, you did. Uh, but yeah. um, uh, uh, I kind of want to kind of recontextualize this into um a bit more uh we have we have four years more so of of comics growing i'll say comics uh i mean well marvel already had like one of their best years on record in 2020 with everyone stuck at home with nothing to do so everyone got back into reading comics yeah. um uh so uh i feel like coming out of pandemic comics have felt even more prevalent in, in the zeitgeist because uh you know infinity war is still somewhat on people's minds um we just had thor come out um and uh, people were stuck at home, so all they did was, you know, get back into their old hobbies. Uh, and so comics and Warhammer, uh, both things I love, benefited a lot from that. <laughs> yep, collecting. Oh, Man, yeah. the amount of collectors now, as far as, you know, yeah. toys and collectibles. Holy moly, it's really shot up. Oh, yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Um, so we're going to kind of recontextualize this now with uh, four years of growth since uh, Yang's, uh, Mr. Yang's TED Talk. So we're going to be talking about uh, some some virtues and in a modern context of what we think uh, of how you know we think the comics should be featured in in classrooms and, and why we think they make you know good educational material and also I have a few statistics at the back end here that uh, uh, also serve more so as like a you know, a general uh, for comics. Uh, so the first one, which is um, you know probably the closest one to to where my uh, we get passions come from is comics as a form of literature. 
Yeah, I would agree yeah. with that. Def- absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's so many really good, rich stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. going to share my screen real quick. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There we go. So. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. yeah, that's good. That's good. That's the main Joker from Trumps. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Of course, it looks like another Joker, but you know you yeah. can't really do a Joker without looking like some Joker, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, it is a common theme. Um, but yeah, so uh, treating comics as a form of literature. I mean, you. Uh, I, I mentioned you know when I went to high school, we had a a film as a literature class that is already considered you know, to be a, a form of academic standard. Um, and, uh, you know, even before that, you had, you know, everyone's favorite, uh, English and theater. Uh, so we've already, we've always kind of had this idea of tying visuals into uh, the written language as a way of, you know, um, not just developing... Um, a sense of the humanities, but also developing your senses of critical thinking, uh, being able to break down a story. And I believe that the comics can absolutely uh, still provide that sort of um, uh, a pin cushion for critical thinking that you can absolutely uh, break down the, the narratives of a comic, uh, especially uh, some of those like really uh character heavy indie ones or early DC comics. You can really break down the, the narrative elements and the structure of that. And I develop a real critical understanding of, of what the, the author's intent was. Uh, so uh, I, I, we mentioned this in our blog post uh, that went up today uh, talking about the, the DC or full script style of writing the comic uh, and how it allows you to really uh, create uh, a character rich story because you're you're writing dialogue first before the action gets to page, and I, I, uh, as far as you know, uh, breaking down uh, literature style, that same kind of style. I feel like um, you know early DC or Alan Moore style of writing uh, really lends itself well to that. Um, you you mostly stick to the Marvel way, don't you? Or, or... I, I actually write. Uh, I most. <laughs> I mostly read Marvel comics, but I mostly write DC style full script. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is kind of funny. Um, I also I actually at... have positive things to say about both those, mm-hmm. uh, both those ways. Uh, you know, but, on the one yeah. hand, it takes a little bit of the guest work out. Yeah. You know. Uh, so yeah. So yeah. yeah. The, the other way, you have a little more freedom, but it's all it's always trade offs. Yeah. You know, with everything. Yeah, I, I, I did mention that also on our blog post that went live today that um, uh, there's pros and cons to each. Uh, like I was saying, uh, full scripting style it, uh, allows you to take guesswork out. So, you know, if you're as an artist and you're working on something, it gives you a lot more context to work with when creating the page. But also, yeah. it, it gives you uh, some context for feedback. So, a, you, uh, you know, if you're just doing the summary style, there might be something that I, I'm visualizing that's important, but they may not come across that way. So, when you offer to change something, you know, you may not be on the same page, but if you see, you know, the full script, you're like, well, I see what you're going for, but I don't think it's working out this way. What if we change this? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, uh, and we'll be having another blog post on how to write Marvel style or page summary uh, shortly. But, um, and, and now both, both styles are now mostly referred to as uh, full script and summary uh, as the editors at DC and Marvel kind of, no longer care as much about the formatting as long as you get it in. That's what they care about. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you just need books in on time and try not to, you know, write uh, 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 trash. Um, and uh, another benefit for comics as a form of literature. Um, uh, one of the reasons that uh, literature in English is taught in schools is also to help... Uh, you know, the youths develop a uh, lexicon of uh, of English that they're able to better communicate and express themselves. And, you know, studies have constantly shown the best way to do that is to read and engage with new words. Uh, yep. And I believe this is still true. Uh, I can't remember the last time. The... On average, uh, comics have the most rare words per... 
uh, of the most, yeah, uh, rare words of any written format. Um, really? Wow. So yeah, if you break it down, the last time this uh, was taken, on average, you end up finding 53 rare words per thousand words in a comic book. In an adult novel, it's 50 to 52. And then in the children's book, it's 30. So, yeah. uh, and there are children friendly comics that still meet that quota. So if you get your kids into comics early on, they're probably going to develop a deeper and more rich lexicon. And I absolutely uh, agree with that because whenever I was growing up, that was a thing that a lot of people would say. Of course, it wasn't a good thing to them. They, mm -hmm. they, they It was kind of a joke against me, but uh, they'd say, yeah, he uses those big words. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't using any real big words either. <laughs> you know, when somebody says that after yeah. you say something that's not really a big word, <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. Uh, you yeah. know, but anyway, yeah, I would totally agree with that. Yeah, it definitely improves a person's vocabulary. I mm -hmm. even think it uh, improves because of their vocabulary being improved. I believe it helps with their uh, basic communication. Yes. And, you know, that's a huge deal, especially for somebody who's growing up is to be able to express themselves mm -hmm. fully. I believe it takes a lot of tension off of them to be able to actually, you know, say what they're feeling and thinking and yeah. use, you know, language to do it, you know, because a lot of times uh, things happen to people and they don't really have a vocabulary to really got uh, you know a deep vocabulary to go to to be able to describe you know how they're feeling and it leads yeah. to more frustration especially you know with kid you know stuff that happens with kids but yeah. anyway i'm that's getting cool. way off track there but anyway i know that's yeah that's fine um but yeah uh, i had a uh, uh english instructor that uh who also did deba uh, debate and um uh, he defines, you know, the art of argumentation as being uh, the process of uh, uh, transplanting an idea from one mind to another. Yep. Uh, uh, and the idea is uh, not necessarily that they have to agree with it, but just that you are able to fully uh, present the idea with context. Uh, and if you can't do that, if you find yourself lacking for words or uh, if you find that uh, you're not able to express yourself as, as precisely as you might want. And that's when frustration happens. And that's when, you know, communication starts to break down. Yep. So uh, definitely uh, uh, doing everything you can to uh, develop a stronger vocabulary uh, can, can uh, strengthen that, that, that skill set. Well, it's, uh, it's difficult enough as you live and you grow and you experience new things. It's hard enough that you've never felt or never had some certain thing happen to you before. And it's, you know, it's something that you really need to get off your chest, you know, and uh, you know what I'm saying? It's hard enough to have, have a vocabulary for everything anyway, it's, you know, every new thing that happens to you, but then to have a very limited, mm -hmm. uh, you know, vocabulary at best, just very limited, then that's even worse, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, um, really, you know, I try to stress that I, whenever I was teaching, uh, but anyway, uh, I also taught English, uh, but you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it now, but yeah, it's been years ago. That's fair. But yeah. Um, and then, you know, that, that work, work that ties back into new comics being a, a literary format. Um, this, that. Uh, richness of language uh, tied in with the visual storytelling element. Um, uh, it forces uh, the reader to uh, not only you know think about the the you know the actual action on page, but um, the movements and choices the characters are making physically, uh, as well as the the language presented and what that means. So. Uh, when they are developing a, a sense of critical thinking, it forces them to to think about uh, how characters are acting, how the story is progressing in multiple ways, and not just as text or as um, uh, you know art on a page, but a combination of both. So it creates uh, two different layers of thinking that need to be engaged to get a critical understanding of what's happening in a comic book. Yep. It's also a very good way to propagandize and to 
<laughs> to get people, you know, uh, you know, to brainwash people. It's a great yes. way to do that. Well, that's uh, how comic books started. Uh, we got Captain America because uh, a couple uh, Jews in New York were tired of the United States not doing anything about World War II. <laughs> yep. Uh, let me make a CC laugh there. All right. Uh, so this one, next uh, bullet point, I'm going to uh, present... Um, uh, offers it up to you to kind of lead, Quentin. Uh, but uh, comics also as a form of art study. Uh, so you know, traditionally, you know, if you're taking an art class, you have you know, studies of, you know, different forms of the painting or rendering, perhaps even physical media. Um, uh, and sometimes you end up getting, you know, the, the breakdowns of, of set dressing or, or of plays or anything like that. But uh, I believe comics also form a, a new and, uh, exciting way to perform art study. So I'll kind of let you lead that and how, how you think as an artist, uh, comics present themselves as a way to do that. I'm going to sound like a total shill here <laughs> but, but because I'm doing comics and I like comics. But as an artist, I was not always a comic artist. Um, and I, my, even my day job, I'm not a comic artist. I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. I, I am going to say this, and I'm there's probably never going to be a truer statement come out of my mouth. I believe that if you are an artist and you are serious about your art, I believe that it is crucial for you to do comic art. I'm just going to say that the reason why I say that is, is because it forces you to draw things that you would never draw. It forces you to deal with things like anatomy of people, anatomy of dogs, cats, animals. Uh, it, it forces you to deal with geometry. It forces you to deal with perspective, uh, gestures. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. I could just sit here. It will make you put variety into your ability and, as an artist, I mean, it's it has helped me in everything and every aspect of art that I have went for. It has really uh, accentuated is really pushed everything to that next level doing comics or comic art. Uh, you know, it just it does. And I would I would suggest if anybody is an artist that you need to do, even if you're doodling, you know, doodle in some panels you know doodle some different stuff you know it i, I just I, I love comics i love what it's done for me like drawing comics uh because uh in my job i have to be able to on a whim i have to be able to draw all kinds of different things like i i may be drawing an 18 wheeler one minute i may be drawing a skitter the other minute and then i may be having to do mickey mouse you know and comics have really helped me to be able to do that it's given me the variety you know that i need uh but i don't even remember what the question oh, i probably it? veered way off but i don't remember no, what the question was you're good we're talking about comics as an art study so uh you know uh, oh yeah. And, yeah and and you know another thing too is uh is uh because you're doing these things and you, that these things are required in the panels or for you doing these comics it makes you notice things a lot more. Like when you see a car or a truck, a lot of people just see the shallow visual truck or car. And, but an, an artist who is trying to see that to draw it is going to notice more intricate details about it. You know, is going to try to search it a little bit more, look a little bit harder. And, um, Makes you, you know, makes you a little more observant, I'd say, as well. So Absolutely. anyway, yeah, and and even if um, uh, the thing that also informs of uh, studying like uh, art history, uh, yes, yeah, yep. uh, there's, uh, well, you know, we have not had you know, two thousand years of comics. Well, we have uh, cave drawings, which are kind of the first form of you know, translational art, um, and then. Uh, with the, uh, I forgot, it's not hieroglyphics, but the form of a Egyptian storytelling that was uh, like that, where, combi where you had full narratives drawn out over the edge of the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, similar concept. Uh, there, there's a long history of you know consecutive storytelling. 
uh, through um, a mix of art and words. Um, it's almost like, though, you know, uh, you, you say that, but it is almost like kind of the the spirit of comics was there. It just hadn't been realized yet. And, mm-hmm. put, you know, panel after panel after panel. Yeah, you know, backing up each other, but you know, people were doing pictures that were telling a story. Yeah, it, it, they just weren't using consecutive panels, but you know yeah. that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and you know, uh, now there has been uh, almost a hundred years of comics. Uh, yeah, right, with several different uh, ages and styles and variations, and you can also see the you know, advent and rise of technology in art through that. But you end up getting a lot of sim, uh, similar Im- images that you can compare and contrast the same way you would through art history. Uh, and also seeing, you know, um, artist intent and perspective and, uh, you know, uh, how moments were captured through art or recreated through art. Um I mean, how many, you know, if you're taking art history class, how many, like, facades of historical buildings do you, like, end up, like, seeing every so often where it's just a painting of, like, a historical building and then you break down their perspective and, you know, the mood the artist captured with that? Yeah. But then we look at, um, uh, you know, not to throw on horns, but you go to uh, the Christmas edition of Wolf Hunter. And we have, you know, we see the city of London during the Blitz, which is something that, you know, uh, has been recreated but it, it, we create our, we do our own way of recreating that and, and capturing our own mood and perspective of that we get the inside of saint martin's on the hills and um we end up you know creating a whole new thing where we we did the uh facade of the bbc building after it was bombed but there's still being worked on you know and you can like you know our subconscious is probably working on that in ways that we didn't expect because that's the way art works usually is that uh, people tell us the meaning that they found afterwards and we just nod and smile. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I totally was not going for that, but <laughs> yes. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, we got that comment on the, uh, you know, the, the, the BBC where uh, we, we captured it. And, and I noticed this uh, after it's brought up to me, but, uh, you have the BC, you have the, you have the BBC building after it's been bombed in a heroic angle and like almost like it's standing defiant like you would you know, after superman's been beat up and, and punched down but you end up getting that angle of him standing star- uh, him standing tall it's from like uh three quarters down below him looking up at his chin yeah and you see the sunrise in the background and we had that same and he did that same angle at the bbc building where, where you know i didn't even think about that it was one of those things <laughs> that just kind of happened it was uh one of those happy accidents yeah Exactly, and all things. I was like, "Wow, you guys really did like uh, make make it like you know they've been bombed, but they're still doing their job. They're still reporting. Like, yeah, yep, we, that's what we meant to do. <laughs> yep, the whole time. Yep. But uh, you get you end up presenting that same opportunity to break down art and think about it critically as you would with art history uh, through comic books. Yeah, uh, and I, I just had to say too. You know, there are so many things. You know. Uh, there's so many things when you do a panel that uh, honestly, if you are a, you could go nuts doing a comic page mm-hmm. if you didn't just kind of let things fly and just be creative. Cause there's so yeah. many rules to so many different things. Talking about that angle, what you said, that angle looking up, that's a power angle because you're looking up at it. You know, now if you're looking down on somebody, usually that's the, uh, the opposite you know like they're you know you're looking down on them so they don't look powerful anymore they look like ants you know so anyway there's all these things to consider there's the angle of the shot there's the uh the perspective you know how hard do you want to go with it there's the you know the the sight lines and i mean there's all these rules and if if you if you got into that and just thought of all those rules all the time 100 percent I think a lot of times you'd miss your message, but that's mm-hmm. totally off topic as well. But yeah. uh, I was just, I was just thinking about that, uh, you know, while doing comics, sometimes you can't go by the book. You have to, mm-hmm. when you're trying to convey a, a message, you have to kind of go with a feeling and what makes you feel, you know, what is going to make people feel the way you want them to feel. Yeah. Not necessarily what am I following the rule, 
you know yeah yeah and that's something like um you know uh and usually we can just kind of like go autopilot and and work on what we're feeling or what we were visualizing because our brain is uh, our brains are been exposed to those rules, so we've internalized them where we have, you know, yep. put, put them somewhere in the subconscious. Um, and that's what it really allows uh, our reader to, you know, have a really critical engagement with it is that uh, if we're, you know, not doing everything by the book, if they're able to uh, see that, you know, this was a, a general part of emotion and understand what each choice that we made subconsciously does, um, and, and they're able to dissect that as a reader. Uh, that's how I end up getting some really, you know, deep interpretations of, uh, of you know, that's how I get deep interpretations of literature that um, uh, authors didn't necessarily intend. I, was, uh, I forgot the guy who wrote uh, J.D. Salinger, the guy who wrote Catcher in the Rye. Uh, he hated that people were critically breaking down his book. <laughs> but uh, he's like, I, I don't intend this at all. I just wrote the story. And everyone is like, no, there's a lot here that we can unpack. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you know, comics absolutely offer that same sort of opportunity that, you know, presents something that uh, readers can unpack visually uh, uh, just by seeing, you know, the, the choices that artists made unconsciously. Yeah. And, you know, there's just uh, there's really just so many choices to to make mm -hmm. at any given moment, you know, um, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, you know, sometimes things, you know, you have this crazy idea and sometimes it really does well, sometimes not so, not so well. No. Uh, but, but, you know, you try every time, but mainly the main thing is, is, you know, you, you can't always follow the rules. Sometimes it's about, you know, yeah. uh, just conveying the feeling or the story that the writer was trying to get and you as an artist trying to make it as impactful as possible, you know? Definitely. All right. Uh, next one I have here is talking about uh, nonfiction comics. Um, and there's something here that I actually just recently found out about, which kind of blew my mind, but uh, let me get that tab open back up again. But uh, obviously the first thing I think of, I think of a nonfiction comic is uh, the ones that do yeah, historical stories or historical narratives. Um, I was, uh, the, co the comic that I had, well, what read for school, uh, when I got to college was mouse, which everyone who goes through full sale, uh, reads mouse. Uh, but it's, uh, it's stylized. The characters are, are recreated as, you know, cats and mice, but it's a, it's a nonfiction story about, um, uh, a, a son, you know, learning about the Holocaust from his father who survived through it. And mm. uh, yeah, so it's it's a retelling of the uh, both his story and his father's story, and the um, uh, from you know the, the, the great tragedy of the 20th century. So, uh, it capturing that survivor's experience uh, through a comic. Um, not only does it uh, create another great like uh, position to engage just as a reader of literature, but uh, also, it, it captures a um, historical, um, you know, a story from a perspective that isn't, you know, is not common to find. Yeah. Um, you know, what I find funny is watching these YouTube videos sometimes that uh, they're they have a opportunity to have a moving emotion media with mm -hmm. using YouTube. But instead, they're drawing the things out on the screen as they're talking. And yeah. people are watching that. You know, people are watching that because it's it's cartoons and it's comics. You know, it yeah. just does something. It just it just drives it home. You know, yeah, it, it's that uh, uh, Drew Yang kind of uh, Gene Yang. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, mentioned that on his uh, TED talk uh, from four years ago that. Uh, you, call, you said the comics are are permanent, and that uh, the future, present, and past all exist at the same time on the page. So you're engaged in something visually, and it's something that you can you can you can stick and reflect on, you know, back and forth. So for some people, that does resonate more than uh, a traditional like moving film, or anything like that, where you, if you miss something, you might need to pause and go back. But instead, it's all, all laid up for you at the same time. Yeah. 
and uh yeah it's uh there's um a ton of other nonfiction uh, stories like that that are uh, i've been turned to comics uh me oh, i can't remember the name of it now um but uh, you know there's uh uh one that uh, i've been that i enjoyed recently was uh the name of the character but it was about the uh you know start of the like jazz and blues movement in new orleans and they they captured uh this story of one of the you know pioneers of that movement and that was turned into a comic uh it was on uh uh comiXology a while ago and it just, i found it and like that thing seems to add to my library and it was, it was a good read but um you know there's a lot of uh other stories and and room for more stories to be told that way where uh it instead of you know uh turning to the film or just doing it strictly as prose it works best doing it as uh, a permanent visual medium in a comic yeah so, uh for uh the same reason why you know there's value in, in you know kids reading the diary of van frank in, in high school and and studying like the, the stories of historical figures uh comics present that same sort of opportunity with um uh, perhaps a way to engage them deeper. Yeah, I would definitely love to see uh, more stuff like, uh, you know, uh, like you were just saying, uh, that would be so awesome to have. Can you imagine having a history book that actually has, you know, like uh, more of an illustrated kind of presence in there, yeah. you know, telling the stories and stuff, how crucial that would be to somebody learning something. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas they would no normally just be, you know, staring at the ceiling. You yeah. Know? Wow. That would be great. Yeah. That's, and, that's why they should be in the classroom, Mr. Tim. Yes. And, uh, and then also there is the skill development comics. I mean, one of the ones that's everyone who works in comics probably knows is Scott McCloud's books where he does books on, on writing and illustrating, but done as a comic. Mm -hmm. uh and it's obviously have value but something that i just learned about which kind of blows my mind is the fact that there is now a whole subgenre of stem uh science um uh, technology engineering math comics really so uh so some things that i came across that are interesting there is the manga guide to relativity which is breaking down i sense relativity through a manga comic uh the cartoon guide to genetics uh, yeah. Uh, awesome astronomy, the Jack. This whole, you know, you uh, know, some of these things you're mentioning, they better have it in a comic form, or else I may I not get it. Exactly. <laughs> you, know? Say, you know, I might, I might now uh, get deeper into my uh, understanding of relativity if there's a, <laughs> a book that breaks it down through uh, yeah. manga. Yeah. But uh, and you know, for uh, for us, that works great, but. You know, it kind of presents then the immediate use, uh, use case uh, that, you know, for, you know, kids that grew up nerdy that, you know, may not engage with a dry and stereotypical textbook presenting that through a visual medium. You know, they tried to do it with Schoolhouse Rock and, you know, Magic School Bus. <laughs> and those are it for where they were, but presenting that in a, in a more permanent format where, you know, the, the same value you get from having a textbook and that you can flip back and forth as needed and you can reference in the moment um that you can't necessarily do with a tv show or, or movie but then the same or perhaps even a greater level of engagement than you would get with a movie or tv show having it presented uh visually as well yeah we need some comics about the uh fourth dimension I i've yes. i've tried to watch stuff because i'm so interested in it, but i just don't uh, i just don't understand it you know they they yeah. throw out all these terms and stuff and jargon yeah. and uh you know i want to understand it and they they try to explain it you know as best they're able but i just can't you know and i try but i just can't you know my eyes yeah. glaze over i love stuff yeah. like that though i love to learn anything i can you know about that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so interesting yeah that's yeah 100 and it's interesting that uh, you know uh my day job is as a, as a content writer so i create the you know the how-to's and the frequently asked questions and all that stuff that you find like on web posting but 
Uh, and there's definitely like an audience for it, but me personally, when I do the same thing, like I'm just going to go to a YouTube video or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I definitely like there's, you know, going to be some great value as, as that genre continues to grow. And uh, if that were to be used in, you know, more so in schools, uh, especially at you like. You think it will? Well, what do you think? I mean, uh... I I, th- I would think so because you know, uh, I like were talking about earlier, uh, mainstream uh, recently. So I definitely think that there's people who uh, are passionate about these subjects. I mean, they, you know, I can't imagine being a person who's passionate about meth, but they're out there, uh, and if they're wanting to share that passion through. Uh, a, a comic if they if they love both things then uh, there's definitely now a, a greater market opportunity for them to do that there's less gatekeepers to get in the way of stopping them from doing that I think that's going to be key is mm-hmm. getting somebody in there who is well like us you know passionate or at least not even passionate but is familiar with comics enough to know yeah, just how powerful they can be you mm-hmm. know and yeah. I mean, for you to not think so anyway, you you're crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, just, uh, the, you know, all like we were talking about earlier, all the stuff that was going on during World War Two, all the people who were turned, you know, their their ideas were totally changed by, all you know, all of the things going around in comics and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's people who probably dreamed of signing up, you know, for the armed forces just from stuff that they saw in comics, you know, and I know some even today, you know, from like GI Joe and stuff like that, when we were growing up that, you know, they became soldiers and stuff yeah. and there, there again, you know, that's comics and, and all that. That's, it's a very powerful medium, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I, yeah, it's a, uh, somebody somewhere there is going to take somebody that has a real appreciation for it uh to really get it you know implemented somewhere yeah definitely and you know if i was you know teaching like elementary school math or you know science or whatever and i had you know the cartoon guide to genetics that'd be very easy to slot that into the curriculum just like we're talking about genetics this month and here's a way to do it through uh, a comic book (laughs) well me being an artist whenever i was teaching i used my dry erase board a lot Mm -hmm. and i was constantly drawing on it yeah explaining what i was doing and everything abs i mean just constantly drawing on it yeah and you know whenever i started feeling like people were kind of you know getting a little uh away Mm -hmm. then i would you know i would do stuff like uh you know draw a little building while i was talking i'd have a guy falling off of it and another guy pushing him you know and then they you know they'd Mm kind of snap back you know and uh uh yeah so Definitely. Yeah. I um, forgot all about that. I hadn't even thought about that <laughs> in a long time. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Uh, and the, uh, yeah. Um, uh, last kind of two general points I have listed here. And this is kind of like uh, interesting, you know, food for thought. And, and the, the uh, you know, the, you know, consistently the studies show that like the, uh, you know, best indicator for you know, uh, academic performance usually comes from uh, how much does you know someone read on their own time, and obviously they're outliers, and that's not like a universal truth. Or people who like reading is absolutely not how they learn, but statistically, that seems to be a majority of mm-hmm. cases, at least for the way that our education system, educational system is currently built. Uh, but recently, within I want to say the last five years, they did a study in. Uh, uh, school library usage and schools that had a substantial uh, library of comics uh, or uh, collection of comics in their school library uh, saw an increase of the of the library usage uh, by students uh, up to 82 percent. Wow! So they're yeah, like they have uh, they're having an increase. Eighty percent more students went to uh, school libraries that had a substantial uh, collection of comics, and then in those same libraries, they found that um, uh, w- 
because they had a uh, a substantial amount of comics drawing students in, they also saw an increased circulation of non-comics material by 30%. So uh, it's kind of a you know a law of averages. The more students you got into the library, they're also more likely to check out other non-comics material. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, uh, getting comics, to, getting kids to read comics, also uh, statistically, it's likely to get them to read, you know, more and, and different material. So, uh, in terms of you know, getting them to develop a, a deep relationship with the English, developing those you know critical thinking skills or, or uh, interest at least in, in some of those subject matters. Uh, comics seem to be uh, play a part in that. Well, I also say, you know, as far as reading, the, the, the good thing about getting somebody to read as opposed to them getting everything from just the medium of television or YouTube mm-hmm. is that when you read, st- you, stories are so much more detailed. And so, yeah. much, I mean, uh, everything, you know, TV is really just like a, I mean, you can never put the amount or the depth of something in mm-hmm. a TV show. It's always the filtered, abridged version of whatever it's coming from, yeah. you know. And if you can get somebody to, you know, read above, you know, uh, you know, getting what they get from just, you know, television and stuff like that, then they get mm-hmm. they could really get in deep into some stuff. And if comics, you know, can help them do that, you know absolutely yeah yeah and you know there 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 are uh yeah it's that thing there there, uh, there is you know there is challenging television there's television that can be substantial that can you know yeah. present a certain way to challenge you but uh i find the same thing where uh especially like Amer- uh, american television media the um I'm, i mean I, I i watch all the disney plus shows i'm a nerd I'm, of course i'm going to but it, it does not provide the same, uh, you know, richness of depth as, you know, prose or uh, a written comic does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it sometimes, you know, if the, the, you can get stories that are, that do challenge their ways um, and force you to, to think about what is happening. Uh, first couple of seasons of the expanse definitely felt like that for me, but um, if a, a story is written well, you're going to be doing that the entire way throughout. Uh, as opposed to you know, uh, yeah. With a lot of television now, it just feels like you you sit down and you're fed everything. You're not engaging with it, right? Yeah, I agree with that a- absolutely. All right. Well, that's been all the bullet points that I have. Uh, Quentin, do you have any uh, additional thoughts? Any, any nuggets that you you've uh, thought up while we've been talking about this? Uh, not really. Uh, I, I I totally agree that uh, art should take more precedence in school uh you know there's a lot of people who they don't really you know give much uh you know much clout to art you know mm-hmm. they they consider it to be more playing you know but yeah. you know uh we both you and i and uh probably a lot of the people who are watching this have that have an appreciation for art know what the power of it is and mm-hmm. And not just the doing of it, but the seeing of it and the, you know, the partaking of it in any form is, is crucial. And it, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I hate that, you know, people look at it as just uh playtime or play mm-hmm. in or whatever. I, I mm-hmm. wish, uh, you know, that schools and other things could take it more serious. I know when I was in school, you know, uh, I was I, I was a budding artist and I was trying anything I could to improve my craft. And this is during a time when there was no YouTube back in my day. <laughs> you know, you had if you wanted to do something, you had to find somebody who was doing it. And mm-hmm. you had to, for no pay. You had to go up under them and and learn it. And I'm talking about anything. You yeah. know, especially art. And if you could find somebody in your area that was good, I mean, good luck getting them to show you how to do stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. But, but you know, uh, you know, and I went to, because we had some stuff going on at our school, you know, I'd ask them, you know, when, when 
uh, I'd heard, you know, we were ha getting some sort of art classes or something. When I went and inquired about it, it was like three scheduled for three years after I was graduating. <laughs> uh, so i mean it was like you know so i never was able to be formally trained i pretty yeah. much just had to you know do do whatever i could you know you got to be your own advocate about stuff like that you know i mean uh you know you have to if you're going to be an artist you, you're going to have to be an artist and you're going to have to do the work <laughs> you know i mm -hmm. mean you can't rely on other people or any of that stuff but anyway yeah uh, that's what I have to say about it. Art is crucial. It's needed. It's needed in schools. I think schools should take a uh, harder line, you know, to, to try to implement it more. Yeah. And I'm not saying that just because I'm an artist. I'm saying that as a human being. Yeah. A human yeah. being. The line always that lives in my head, rent free forever uh, from uh, Dead Boat Society. I'm talking to students because, uh, you know, uh, science, math, uh, you know, these are important things that, you know, they, 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 uh, help us live, but poetry, prose and art, those give us a reason to live. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you know, I know I was thinking about this just today and this has nothing to, I, I don't, maybe I can work it around to where it has something to do with what we're talking about. But, <laughs> uh, I was thinking today, you know, you know, you go to school. And let's say now, look, everybody wants your doctor or your nurse to have a degree. You want mm -hmm. them to have the doctorate. But, you know, I was thinking, what is the you know, when it comes to artists, you know what? Somebody can have a bachelor of arts degree or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, but. But honestly, if, if they say they've got a Bachelor of Arts, you know, and then they, they show you their art and it's like a third grader. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, um, yeah. I was just thinking about that, you know, how people go to school and they for somebody else to bestow upon them after they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time, uh, you know, they they wait for them to bestow upon them some sort of degree or piece of paper that says, okay, you're officially this, you're mm -hmm. officially a doctor or you're officially. And Hey, like, again, I'm not knocking that. <laughs> I want my doctor to have a good degree and yeah. have all those years of schooling. But when it comes to other stuff, you know, how do you quantify stuff like art mm -hmm. and stuff like music you know, I mean, uh, it's really about the person getting out there and getting his own doctorate mm -hmm. and doing it, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's a lot uh, of personal work. Yeah, it's a lot of personal work. And uh, having the schooling in place there to uh, help them start that Get engagement you started, early. But you're going to yeah. have to do it. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to do it. It's good to learn techniques and stuff. Mm -hmm. Techniques are great. But you know what? It's it's about doing it too. Yeah, and uh, yeah. That's that's uh, the reason why I liked my program, uh, and I think it's something you know. If you're going through a portfolio, or if you're going through a PhD, you have to present like a PhD defense. You have to create a theory and then uh, sit there as they put questions and I critique it, and then present like you know a reasonable response to those critiques. And you're not supposed to be perfect. You're supposed to have, like they they are going to put holes in, it and you're supposed to you know be able to present like, well, thinking about that, this is how I'll proceed with that in the future. Like how this is how we'll like investigate that poke, that, that theory, counter theory. Uh, with my program, uh, you had to do like kind of like a portfolio defense where we had to create, you know, certain like written elements and then have them be critiqued off our response to them and then create like revisions and edits to that to, to match, you know, a, a critiqued, you know, uh, a thought, uh, I will critique the nor review process to creating, you know, a final form of art. And uh, I don't know if all schools do that, but I think, you know, for a lot of art programs, something like that would also be uh, very beneficial is to have, you know, you know, art is subjective. Everyone has different tastes, but yeah, there, there are certain rules and, and things that like you learn them first. So that way then you learn when you can break them. <laughs> exactly. And so having that same sort of uh, thing where like, you know, as someone tells you, well, I like this, but I think this is where you can improve on. And, and having that same sort of uh, like art defense or like defense of your art would, would be really beneficial in, in terms of just, uh, you know, so when you did get that degree in art is like, well, I went through, I got beat up and then I was able to change and grow through that. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I always tell uh, my kids, and that's how I cook, too. You know, I always mm -hmm. go by 
however the ingredients say to do it first before I become a scientist and start experimenting yeah. with making these cookies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it is. Hey, experimenting with baking, as usual, always. <laughs> things get really yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's, oh. and yeah, I prefer doing a uh, uh, pan cooking because then it's just kind of free from jazz. You just kind of throw things on there until it smells good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just season it down until it until it's right. Yeah. All right. Well, we've been at Silver Lush eight eight at uh, that's a bunch on a Tuesday. Uh, this has been Y Comics Pilon in the classroom. Hopefully, we have uh, provided some some interesting points for you to think of and how you can use comics as educational material. <laughs> um. So, uh, but uh, our our time has been reduced uh, per orders from upstairs. So we're going to be uh, cutting it off shortly here. I'm going to throw our banner on there. Uh, we do have a Kickstarter that's currently live. I don't think we have a... We do have a... Play our trailer for a Kickstarter, and then we'll do our sign-off. All right, and also we're trying to uh, get uh, as much stretch goals done as possible. This is a yeah. stretch goal right here. This is uh, going to be digital coloring pages. Let me just show off another one. Uh, right here. Can you see that? Ooh, There's uh, here's one for Teen Beetle, and then we have uh, we have a couple more. Let me see if it's here. Doctor Mantis. There he is, Doctor Mantis. It's gonna be a coloring page right there. That's what I'm doing right now is coloring pages for. Let me find the other one though. Is this it? Yeah, I think this is it. Yeah. So. This is all along with the the already you know stellar value that yeah. is coming in the Kickstarter. Go on over and check it out. Look at it. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll like it. It's a good buy. All right. Now a word from our sponsors. Hi, and welcome to our Kickstarter. I am Roland Mann, and I run Silverline Comics, and this is our 19th Kickstarter. Yes, 19! We have successfully funded and fulfilled 17. Why not 18, you ask? Because we're still in the middle of shipping those books. So it'll make it. We're just now in July. So it's going to be on time. But I'm here to tell you about the next one. This time we've got three comics in one Kickstarter. But I'm going to shut up yakking, and I'm going to let me tell you about Trumps. Take it away, Roland. Hi. Let me tell you about Trumps. Trumps is a superhero sci-fi story set on the deck. Yes, it's about playing cards. There are four kingdoms at war. You might guess hearts, spades, diamonds, and clubs. Yes, they're at war. The one who wins, the one who has the most power, can declare themselves Trumps. We don't know who that's going to be. You don't know who that's going to be yet because you've got to back the Kickstarter to find out who's going to win. Which kingdom will be declared Trumps? This is number three in a four-issue miniseries, and I'm, I'm happy to tell you four is so close to being done. We'll be kickstarting it very soon. Hi, this is John Crowther. I am the writer and co-creator, along with artist Del Barris of the Teen Beetle series, and I am excited to announce uh, that we are coming back to Kickstarter with Silverline. And uh, once again, uh, we are seeing Teen Beetle in his battle with uh, Dr. Mantis, as Dr. Mantis is trying his hardest uh, to seize the formula for vitamin 2X. Uh, and as you know, that is how Team Beetle gets its powers. So uh, join us. Uh, I invite you to join us. Pick up this second exciting issue and uh, get ready for the third one. Switchblade is the story of Scott Nathans. Set in New Orleans, Scott is just a small time boxer hanging out trying to make day to day. But he gets fed up with the justice system when a couple of killers are let loose by the justice system because the policemen forgot to read them their Miranda rights. And everyone knows that they killed this little girl and did nasty, despicable things to him. So Scott decides to take justice into his own hands and he becomes a switchblade. It's a three issue miniseries and it's set in the world of cat and mouse. So hope you come along. Don't those sound exciting? Yes, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, they do sound exciting. And you, 
you want them. You know you do. You know you want to pledge. You know you want to push a little button that says pledge. So that's what we need you to do. We need you to go pick out a tier, probably the extravaganza that has all three of them so that you can get all three books. Pick out that tier, pledge, and then tell all of your friends. But look, I know this is tough times. If you can't pledge, do us a favor, share it. Share it with people and say, hey, these are cool people. They make comic books. They ship comic books. You're going to like them. Go support them. Thank you, and remember to make mine Silverline. Hey, that has been our uh, book for advertisement. Uh, so we're going to be getting ready to sign off here. Uh, Quentin, uh, where can people find you? Uh, what are you currently up to? All the things. Right now, I'm doing stuff for the Kickstarter. I'm working on Night Rise and lots of other stuff. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, DeviantArt, all under Quentin Bedwell or uh, QB1 Kenobi or Kenobi. Um, uh, and that's pretty much it. Perfect. What about you, Mr. Tim? Uh, they can find me on all the social medias at Tim TK writer. Uh, that's Instagram, Twitch, Twitter. Uh, wow. Twitter is mostly just silly takes. Um, but, uh, that's what I'm doing. Uh, currently just, uh, doing, uh, uh, web content for comics and working on, uh, the history edition for Wolf Hunter. Um, so if you backed that, Kickstarter, that book is, is still happening. It's been very busy, and there's a lot of, of history that I want to pack into that. Um, yeah, so that's what I've been up to. Um, and uh, they can find us here again next week at uh, 8 p.m. Pacific time, and you can find our teams here, same channel, but uh, Wednesday and Sunday for uh, Wednesday Wham and Silver Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern time on those days. Uh, next week, I believe we are talking about um, uh, how to start reading comics. Uh, Ooh. yeah. So, uh, as a reader, do you do you collect them all? Do you jump straight in? What the uh, what's what's the best way to do that? Um. And we ought to have. We ought to see if we can get somebody like a special guest that doesn't read comics. Yeah, and and ask them what their problem is. Like, what what is your issue with reading comics? Yes, yeah. What would make it easier for you to read comics? Who knows? That'd be great. Yeah, we should. I'll well, see about that. I don't know. It could be my wife. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've already got our guest. There you go. All right, we'll be back next week with that. Um, so until that, and if you uh, came in uh, on the later end of this video and want to uh, see everything else I've performed, remember that this does go up as a VOD on YouTube and Twitch uh, right after we finish. So uh, until next time, remember to make mine silver, silver line. line. And uh, yeah, that, that's that's what we got for you. Awesome. Don't forget, everybody. Back to Kickstarter.